Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you all here. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, as always, welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. Whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online, it's always a pleasure to see so many folks out to, uh, to talk about the American Civil War, to talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, to talk about, uh, in our case today, a little round top. My name is Christopher Gwynn. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education here at the, uh, the Battlefield Park. And um, again, I'm so happy that you'll, uh, you'll be with me for the next 45 to 50 minutes. I'm not on a Matt Atkinson. <laughs> Chris Gwynn, punctual, schedule. So that's what we're going to uh, try to do today. I want to, um, I want to begin after the American Civil War on October 3rd of 18. 89. That, in case you don't know, is a very special day in Gettysburg history. That is Maine Day. That's when all of the, uh, the veterans from the state of Maine traveled back to the Gettysburg battlefield to dedicate their monuments. Most northern states who had a lot of men who fought at Gettysburg, who had funds given to them by the state to erect those monuments, did something very similar. So Michigan Day at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania Day at Gettysburg. And again, this is an opportunity for all of these veterans and their families and their, their kids to travel down to the battlefield in Pennsylvania to, to watch them set aside these monuments to where they fought July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863, to where their comrades uh, died. And so October 3rd of that year is Maine Day. And it, um, for the, the individuals involved, was a very mournful but also celebratory experience. They traveled around the battlefield. Uh, they dedicated their monuments of the, you know, the 16th Maine, the 20th Maine, uh, the, the, the 17th Maine in the wheat field. And that evening at the Gettysburg Courthouse on Baltimore Street, they had um, their kind of, I would call it a keynote. Sometimes they called it a bivouac or a campfire, but it's when they all got together for a lot of oratory, a lot of speechifying, where the veterans would get up and and talk about what the day meant to them, what the battle meant to them. And the presiding officer that day was going to give the big speech. And that, of course, is none other than our friend Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He, um, he's somewhat obscure. He gives a speech that day that is um, it's quite long. It's a rather good speech. I'm only going to quote a part of it for you today. And chances are you've heard it before because it is used ad nauseum to the point where it's almost cliche. So we have it in our museum on this big wall right as you exit. In the 1990s, the United States Mint put out a commemorative coin focused around battlefield preservation, and they use this quote. And I think it's used so much because it's so darn good. And what Chamberlain is doing as he concludes this big speech is he's talking about what places like Gettysburg mean, what they are. And he's very prophetic. So you can read it up on the screen there. Uh, if you can't see it at home, I'll, I'll read it to you. In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate the ground for the vision place of souls. And reverent men and women from afar and generations that know us not and that we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them, shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. The dude could write. I mean, he, yeah. he had a way with words. And it's very, it's almost Gettysburg address-esque, Lincoln-esque. Chamberlain, in his speech, he doesn't say what a great field is. He doesn't call out any specific battlefield. He doesn't exactly define what those great deeds are. And so for Chamberlain, you know, it might have been Marie's Heights at Fredericksburg. It might be... Uh, the White Oak Road or Five Forks, but chances are Joshua Chamberlain is talking about Little Round Top. That's why he was in Gettysburg, to dedicate the 20th Maine Monument, to talk to other Gettysburg veterans. And for Joshua Chamberlain, and for many, many, many of the other men that fought on Little Round Top on July 2nd, 1863 and survived, their 90 minutes on Little Round Top were the defining moments of their lives. Everything before and after was postscript and prologue. For Joshua Chamberlain, his time at Little Round Top, that's what defines him. It's not the governorship of Maine. It's not even necessarily uh, accepting the surrender at Appomattox. It's Little Round Top. And again, he's, um, 
he's very prophetic. Little Round Top was incredibly important to him. Again, that idea of, of physically going to the hill to commune with the dead, the vision place of souls, going somewhere physical where it connects you to the past. That's what we still do today, 160 years later. Visitors are still, well, not, not right now, but 160 <laughs> years later, visitors are still coming to the battlefield to see Little Round Top in particular, to commune with that place. Now, Matt Callery of Addressing Gettysburg, uh, who's in the front audience here, he once asked me a question that I thought was incredibly profound, and I didn't have a good answer for it. The question was, why Gettysburg? Why Gettysburg? And I'm going to try to answer a question today based off of that. Why Little Round Top? Why, why are we so, as Americans, especially as aficionados of the American Civil War, why are we so drawn to that hill and that story? What is it about Little Round Top that captivates us? And uh, I'll probably pose more questions than I'll answer, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting question to ask. We did a visitor use study. This is one of these big government bureaucratic reports that cost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, we did a visitor use study in 2017 and 2018. And we were trying to figure out, you know, why do people come to Gettysburg? Where do they go? Where are they visiting? And that report, if it's accurate, shows us that the most popular spot on the Gettysburg battlefield, more than this building, is Little Round Top. We estimated that 90% of all visitors who come to Gettysburg to visit the battlefield park, 90% go to Little Round Top. That equates pre-COVID to roughly a million people a year. No other site in the park even comes close to that, including this building. Why? Why? If you are a, a battlefield guide, if you're a visitor to Gettysburg and you go up to Little Round Top, you've seen this. A day in May, you're literally swimming through eighth graders. <laughs> you're parking on the far side of the hill. There's, um, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this big battlefield rehabilitation effort up there is because over 160 years, the hill has literally been loved to death. Why? Why? I think there are a couple reasons. I think there are a couple reasons. And what I'd like to do, uh, do today is go through those. So one, why is Little Round Top so famous? Why are we drawn to it? The geology and geography of the place itself. It's interesting. It's, it's this unique landscape uh, at Gettysburg. It's almost unique in terms of American Civil War battlefields. I won't go quite so far as to say that. But even if you knew nothing about the American Civil War or the Battle of Gettysburg, you could still go to Little Round Top. Uh, leave your car in the parking lot, emerge on the summit, and be just blown away by the view, the battlefield stretching out before you. So the geology, the geography of the hill. Of course, the battle. Without the battle, we're not here. You know, there's probably, you know, housing development where we're standing. But more than that, I think the participants of the battle, how the battle was remembered, and how the, the, the veterans who survived the battle shape the narrative there, and the, the commemorative landscape, as we call it, that's the monuments and memorials on the hill, that plays a huge role. And perhaps, more than anything else, popular culture. Popular culture, films, novels, TV shows, they're going to drive visitation, they're going to create heroes, they're going to create folk heroes and myth and legend. Hamilton Grange, National Historic Site, it's in New York. Has anybody ever been there? few years back, their visitation, it's where Alexander Hamilton lived, their visitation increased 174%. Why do you think that was? <laughs> Not because of a ranger program, because of something else. Popular culture drives visitation to Civil War sites. So let's explore these topics and see if we can, uh, can answer that question. Why a little round top? So geography and geology. I will, um, I, I am not a geologist. I'm barely even a historian sometimes, so take this with a grain of salt. But the, the forces that create Little Round Top go back 200 million years. And as these tectonic plates shift, they create something called the Gettysburg Formation, the Gettysburg Sill. This is an area of, of sandstone and siltstone that over time, uh, magma bubbling up from the surface, they fill in the gaps in this this formation, and it cools. 
and it creates this really hard diabase rock, just granite. And over eons and the millenniums of time, all that loose stuff, erosion washes that away. It erodes that away. And so you end up with this very peculiar rock formation that cuts its way through the Gettysburg battlefield. So again, the forces that create the battlefield where Meade and Lee are going to fight take place 200, 000, uh, 200 million years ago. So Little Round Top is incredibly old. That diabase rock, it's some of the oldest substances that you can find in Pennsylvania. The first inhabitants of what we would call Little Round Top are the Susquehannock tribe, uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, we have archaeological sites in Adams County that, that go back to 6,500 years ago. And so I say that only to remind you all that there's lots of layers of history at Gettysburg, not just the American Civil War. By about 1675, the Susquehannocks are essentially um, gone as a, as a kind of political entity here. And by 1750, there's virtually no Native Americans left in Adams County. And of course, that coincides with colonial settlement. The first settlers around Little Round Top would be the Scots-Irish. And they are mostly subsistence farmers. And if you are a subsistence farmer, what do you need? You need land. You need water. More than anything, though, you need arable land. You need land that you can actually farm. And God bless the poor dude that tries to farm on Little Round Top. <laughs> it is not going to happen for you. And so for most of its history, Little Round Top is not valuable as, as, as a farm, as a place of agriculture. But you could use it as a woodlot, as a managed woodlot. You could use it to, um, to graze your animals as pasture. And that's what the landowners prior to the American Civil War do with Little Round Top. Records are very difficult to ascertain in terms of land ownership. We know that... By the early 1800s, there's a gentleman by the name of Conrad Hoke who owns most of what we would call the Little Round Top area today. Over the course of the 19th century, that chunk of land he owns gets kind of chopped up and sold. So that on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg, we have really three landowners that are controlling Little Round Top. Uh, Jacob Weikert, George Bushman, and most significant for our story today, Ephraim Hanaway. Ephraim Hanaway doesn't live on Little Round Top. He owns the western face of it, so the famous face. And at some point uh, prior to the American Civil War, prior to the Battle of Gettysburg, he clears that western face of trees. They remove all the wood. There's um, some speculation that it was part of an army contract. There's no documentation to prove that. Um, John Batchelder, in his uh, guidebook, Gettysburg, What to See and How to See It, he uh, <coughs> alludes to the fact that it's the year before the battle that that western face is cleared of trees by Hanaway. We don't know that either. We do know at some point it's cleared of trees. William Prasenito in his book, Gettysburg, uh, oh, Early Photography at Gettysburg, believes that it was actually probably a few years before the Battle of Gettysburg, because he could look at some of the photos and tell there's a lot of scrub brush and smaller trees that have grown up on that face, which leads him to believe that it probably wasn't in 1862, a little bit earlier. It's going to be that decision to remove trees from the western face that's going to make Little Round Top significant and valuable for the, the men of the Army of the Potomac. Because now you have an artillery platform, you have a place of observation, uh, you have something that the armies can use. That's what transforms Little Round Top into a place that's going to be important. Otherwise, it would probably be like Big Round Top, of limited utility for the armies. And then, of course, oh, there's the uh, image I was talking about. The western face, this is what Ephraim Hanaway owns. All right, the battle, July 2nd, 1863. Now, this is a story that I hope most of you are familiar with. So I'm going to give you the generally agreed upon chronology of the Battle of Gettysburg, or uh, the Battle of Little Round Top, if there is such a thing. So it's the late afternoon, July 2nd, 1863. George Gordon Meade discovers that Daniel Edgar Sickles and his 3rd Corps have advanced beyond their assigned position. Uh, Little Round Top apparently is left uncovered. At about that same time, James Longstreet is going to launch his massive attack on the Union left uh, with the better part of 18,000 men, ultimately. And uh, that's going to set in motion the chain of events that result in the battle for Little Round Top. At some point, Governor Warren, Chief Engineer, Chief Topographical Engineer of the Army of the Potomac will be sent to Little Round Top to figure out what the heck is going on. And then what uh, follows is a series of crises. First crisis, 
is Warren gets to the top and figures out there's nobody up on Little Round Top. And the Confederate line of battle on Seminary Ridge extends far beyond the position of Sickles Third Corps below, which of course means the hill is in danger. And no sooner does he make this realization than he sees bodies of Confederate <laughs> infantry moving towards his position. And so the story of Little Round Top devolves into a race. Reinforcements are called. First troops to arrive for the Army of the Potomac is the 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps. This is Strong Vincent's Brigade, composed of the 16th Michigan, 44th New York, 83rd Pennsylvania, and of course the 20th Maine. They take position on the lower shelf of the hill 5 to 15 minutes before the Confederate attack begins. Uh, so when you go up to Little Round Top today, you see the rock walls and the fortifications that were built up. Those aren't there when Vincent's Brigade arrives on the hill. Those aren't there during the actual Battle of Little Round Top. Those are built after. Other reinforcements arrive, primarily the Battery of Charles Hazlitt. They drag their guns up to the hill. And then again, another crisis occurs. Confederate troops strike Vincent's Brigade, and both ends of Vincent's battle line start to ever slowly give way. On his right, oh, this is the view of the Confederates attacking the hill. The Confederates who assault Little Round Top are primarily composed of two brigades. Uh, one is Evander Law's Alabama Brigade, and the other is the Texas Brigade, only a portion of that. Uh, they have arguably the most difficult terrain to contend with anywhere on the Gettysburg Battle. And when you read the accounts of the Alabamians and Texans who fought there, I mean, they talk about Little Round Top as a mountain, right? It's a mountain. One soldier described it, it looked like a volcano with smoke and flames spewing into the air. Little Round Top's a difficult place to fight if you're a Texan, if you're an Alabamian. On Vincent's right, the 16th Michigan, led by Colonel Norval Welch, begins to give way. It's the weakest regiment in Vincent's brigade. Uh, they're slowly kind of outflanked by the attacking Confederates. They fall back to a, a little shelf that today is right below the 44th New York Monument. And it's at that moment that strong Vincent, seeing this unfold, rushes to that sector of the battlefield to try to shore up the 16th Michigan and is mortally wounded. Ultimately, though, more Union reinforcements arrive. Of course, this is Patrick O'Rourke in the 140th New York, who climb up the backside of the hill, charge into the advancing Confederates, and secure Vincent's right flank. At the far left end of the line, of course, is Joshua Chamberlain and his 350 men from Maine. They are the extreme left of the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac. They um, are assaulted, attacked first by the 47th Alabama, and then by Colonel William C. Oates in his 15th Alabama. Chamberlain has to refuse his battle line to meet this new threat. After approximately 90 minutes to two hours of combat, the men of the 20th Maine, who have suffered severe casualties, are running low on ammunition. A bayonet charge occurs, which drives the Confederates from the slope, uh, essentially securing that end of Vincent's line on Little Round Top, and thus ends the story of the Battle of Little Round Top as far as we are concerned today. It was not a long battle. Again, 90 minutes. We're going to be in here you know, about half of that time, so it's not a terribly long battle. In terms of overall combatants, we're talking about 3,700 men. Compare that to the wheat field, to the fighting at Culp's Hill on July 2nd and July 3rd. This is a small little battle. It's a small little battle. And I think that's one of the things that makes Little Round Top um, consumable for, for visitors. Americans like their history simple, and ideally in little sound bites that make sense to them. And Little Round Top is kind of that, right? It's a small battle. It's easy to understand. It has this interesting chronology to it. There's this narrative that drives the story. It's like a race. Um, so I think Americans like that. Of course, the reality is much more complex, as we're about to see. But it's a relatively small battle. The casualties in the wheat field far exceed that. The casualties fighting around the peach orchard far exceed that. So it's a small engagement in 90 minutes. Roughly 1,185 casualties, including 279 killed. And thus, the Battle of Little Round Top shifts from an experience that was lived to an experience that is going to be remembered by those that survived the fight. And two things happen in the immediate aftermath of the fighting at Little Round Top in the Battle of Gettysburg. One, Little Round Top becomes some of the earliest preserved battlefield land at Gettysburg. Ephraim Hanaway sells his roughly 77 acres to the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association in 1864. 
Again, this is a group of influential citizens who want to set the battlefield aside to um, honor the Union cause of the Union dead as a memorial to those who fought there. And some of the first land they buy is that little round top. That makes sense. You could go to Little Round Top and see the remnants of combat, the rock walls built up by the troops who fought there. The vista is still incredible. It's, it's, a, it's an alluring landscape, which is part of the reason why early photographers are drawn to Little Round Top. Matthew Brady, uh, Alexander Gardner, they all photograph that area. So the hills preserved. And then, right after the battle, oh, let me go back one. The men that survived try to piece together what they went through. And they try to make sense of it. What did I experience on the hill? Now, first, the, the, the earliest accounts of the battle are either soldiers writing very quickly, I survived, everybody's safe, uh, Jack Calloway died, something like that. And then the official reports that the officers involved are going to write. So Joshua Chamberlain, for example, he writes his first official report of the fighting at Little Round Top on July 6th, 1863. So these are the first accounts of, of the fighting there. And another thing to point out, no one knows what to call the hill. Little Round Top's in common usage today. It is very likely that that name existed at the time of the battle. Uh, Edward Everett, for example, in his November uh, 1863 Gettysburg Address, he refers to Little Round Top. Michael Jacobs, who wrote invasion, uh, notes on the invasion of Pennsylvania, refers to it as Little Round Top. For others, it's the Rocky Ridge, Sugarloaf Knob. It goes by about a dozen names. But those earliest accounts are the officers writing about what they went through. And um, you know, for a lot of the soldiers who fought there, when they remembered the fighting on Little Round Top, what really stuck out to them more than anything were these sensory moments. So there's a gentleman by the name of Porter Farley. He's the adjutant of the 140th New York. And he would write about the sulfurous fumes of the battle, the smell of it. Uh, William C. Oates, who battles Joshua Chamberlain, would write about these coagulated pools of blood on the rocks. You know, other soldiers would recall the click of bayonets, that metallic sound locking into place. And so that sensory component was, was very vivid for a lot of soldiers. But then, like I said, they tried to figure out what they had gone through, what they had survived, and they tried to create a logical order to it, and a logical sequence of events. And over time, they found that to be increasingly difficult to do. Because that very simple story I told you about, that visitors like, that sound like, that narrative that makes sense and flows, that is an illusion. Little Round Top is as confusing and contradictory as any part of the Battle of Gettysburg. And we see that playing out in the post-war period. Another thing men tried to do is they tried to, to pick out the heroes. These are the guys that changed the tide of events on Little Round Top. And then they, they kind of spent the rest of their lives battling other dudes who said, well, no, it was somebody else that was the real hero. And then it begins immediately after the battle. One of the early heroes to emerge from the Battle of Little Round Top, <clears throat> Governor Warner, chief topographical engineer of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, born in Cold Springs, New York, he is all of 33 years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. A brilliant man, brilliant man, graduate of West Point. Uh, spend some time as a mathematics professor at West Point. He's uh, originally the, the colonel of the 5th New York, Dries, Dries, I believe it is, fights at Big Bethel, uh, a capable leader. He, um, he, he was not an imposing figure. When you read about accounts of, of Governor Warren, what he looked like, he's often described as sickly, sometimes as effeminate. There's this, a lot of quotes about Winfield Scott Hancock by soldiers. He said, you know, Hancock, if you looked at him in battle, you felt calm. Hancock's a guy that, you know, even if he were in civilian clothes, you'd still follow his orders. No one says that about Governor Warren. At least not that I found. No one says that. Uh, but he's a very capable officer. He's made, again, the, again, chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac. During the Gettysburg campaign, he actually leaves the armies in mid-June to go to Baltimore to get married to a woman named Emily, Emily Forbes Chase. So in any other conceivable scenario, Governor Warren on July 2nd would probably have been on his honeymoon. Uh, but instead, he's climbing up the rocky slopes of Little Round Top. Remember, he's dispatched to go to the hill to figure out what's going on. And we can't even agree on who sent him to Little Round Top. If you read one account, George Meade sends him there. If you read Warren, well, he, said he went there on his own accord. And there, there's no consensus, even with something as small as that. Warren 
never writes a whole lot about the Battle of Gettysburg, as we'll see. He doesn't write a whole lot about the battle. Uh, he dies fairly young. He dies in 1882 at the age of, I want to say, 52. Um, he never writes a lot about the battle. But he does write one letter to that adjutant of the 140th New York that I mentioned, a man by the name of Porter Farley. And in this letter, which was never meant for publication, he describes his big role in the fighting of Little Round Top. That's arriving on the hill and figuring out the hill's empty and the hill's in danger. Confederates are on the opposite ridge. And it's, it's, a, it's a great account. It's a very kind of vivid description of the moment. And this is Warren's version of him discovering the Confederates. He writes to Farley, I requested the captain of a rifle battery just in front of the Little Round Top to fire a shot into the woods. He did so, and as the shot went whistling through the air, the sound of it reached the enemy's troops and caused everyone to look in the direction of it. The motion revealed to me the glistening of gun barrels and bayonets of the enemy's line of battle already formed and far outflanking the position of any of our troops so that the line of his advance from his right to Little Round Top was unopposed. I have been particular in telling this as the discovery was intensely thrilling to my feelings and almost appalling. That's Warren's story, as written in a uh, letter to Porter Farley. And in that version, who's the hero? <laughs> Governor Warren. I arrive, some Signal Corps guys. I come up with this great plan to fire artillery around over the trees. All the Rebs look at it. I see their line of battle. And then I set in motion uh, reserves coming to defend the hill. It's Governor Warren's story. Do you believe it? How many people believe it? That's how it, that's how it happened. Maybe. There's another version of the story. It's written by a guy named Captain James Hall. Now, James Hall is one of the signalmen that was up on Little Round Top on July 2nd, manning that signal station, reporting to uh, George Meade, the Army commander, the movements of the Confederates on the opposite side of the battlefield. And this account is a little bit different. Uh, according to this, which is published in the history of the Signal Corps, it was Captain Hall's announcement that the enemy were moving around Sickles' left that brought General Warren to Little Round Top. So Warren didn't do it of his own accord. Meade didn't do it, it was Captain Hall. When he reached the station, the enemy were undercover and were scarcely visible except to eyes accustomed to the use of field glasses. Captain Hall found it very difficult to convince General Warren that the enemy's infantry and artillery were there concealed. And while the discussion was in progress, the enemy opened up on the station. The first shell burst close to the station and the general, a moment later, was wounded in the neck. Captain Hall then exclaimed, now do you see them? <laughs> now, Captain Hall's version, Warren shows up, and Hall can look through a telescope, and he can see Confederates over there, and then apparently Warren can't figure out how to look through the glass, and a moment later, a Confederate shell lands on the hill. Warren suddenly realizes, oh, there are Confederates over there after all. And so, so who's the hero of Little Round Top in this account? It's the signalmen, the signal guys. They're the ones that figured it out. Again, something very, very simple. Who found out the Confederates were on the opposite ridge? You have two very, very different accounts of how that unfolded. Warren, though, when you think about what he has in his military career to be proud of, this little rounds off. Because, as I think most of us know, on April 2nd, 1865, the end of the American Civil War, Governor Warren is commander of the Fifth Army Corps. Eight days to go till, till Lee surrenders. <clears throat> At a battle called Five Forts, he is removed from command by Philip Sheridan. And so literally on the eve of the end of the war, in ignominy, he's removed from command. And he will spend the rest of his life trying to repair his tarnished reputation. He demands courts of inquiry into his removal by Sheridan, which President Ulysses S. Grant kind of ignores. It's not until Chester A. Arthur, years later, that Warren gets his inquiry and that he's cleared of all charges. Uh, they found that Sheridan was wrong. Of course, he's not alive at that point in time to benefit from it. But for Governor Warren, Little Round Top, that was his shining moment in the sun. That was the pinnacle of his military career. Now, today you go up to Little Round Top, and what do you find? The Governor Warren statue. I think it's one of the best statues, best commemorative works on the battlefield. 
Um, it's, it's very heroic looking. He looks kind of like a Superman up there on the boulder. Hardly the sickly, effeminate portrait that a lot of his contemporaries painted. And, um, you know, it's, it's the most site-specific of any monument on the Gettysburg battlefield, any, any kind of statuary. That's allegedly the boulder that he stood on. And so you can go up to that, and, and if you're the average visitor, this, you know, statue of Governor Warren that, that dominates that stretch of the hill. Now, meanwhile, and don't, that's the only boulder we tell people don't, don't climb on. It's the only one. If you got shot at by Confederates, you can climb on it. So this is uh, 1913, during the 50th anniversary of the battle. But um, that's, that's, the, that's the monument to the Signal Corps guys. It's the plaque on the boulder, right? So imagine if they had a grander monument, how that might change the experience of visiting Little Round Top, if they had something to compete with the epic statue of Governor Warren. Now Warren, though, will not be the only, the only man who's lionized for his role in Little Round Top. Another man is Charles Hassel, commander of Battery D, 5th United States Artillery. They're the six guns that are ordered to the summit of Little Round Top by Augustus P. Martin, who's the brigade commander, the artillery brigade commander in the 5th Corps. Hazlitt is known, and his story is known for two reasons. One, getting his guns up on top of Little Round Top. There's no, you know, Sykes Avenue doesn't exist in 1863. There is a logging road that is on the hill somewhere, and no one knows for sure where it was. Uh, but other than that, that's the only way to the top. And Hazlitt is ordered to bring his guns up there. So he's got his caissons, he's got his limbers, he's got to get it all up the hill. And when the men of Hazlitt's battery wrote about the Battle of Gettysburg, they spend far more time talking about physically getting the guns up the hill than they talk about the battle itself. Because for them, that was the Herculean task. That was the big effort, getting their pieces up the hill. So um, a couple of good quotes. One is by Benjamin Rittenhouse, who's second in command of Hazlitt's battery. And he's uh, at West Point after the American Civil War, and a cadet asks him how he got the guns up the hill. And Rittenhouse responds, it was during the battle when everything was red hot. The battery was ordered at that point, and that we went there to trot each man and horse trying to pull the whole battery by himself. At one point in time, there's at least one quote, uh, account that has Governor Warren grabbing a wheel trying to get the guns up the hill to the summit. Best quote of all is by Warren, who allegedly says to Augustus P. Martin, Martin, how the hell did you get the guns up here? Which is the question visitors ask today uh, when you go there. Now, another thing, when you go to the summit of Little Round Top today and you see the uh, marker to Hazlitt's battery and where the guns are, that's not where the guns were. That's where the War Department put the guns. If you're an artilleryman, if you're Charles Hazlitt, you get your gun up to the summit, that's only part of the challenge. Now you've got to figure out, okay, where are you going to put the gun where it's not going to topple over, where you're not going to hit a boulder, where it can recoil and it's not going to roll down the hill. And so he's, he's opportunistic. He puts a gun wherever the hill can accommodate. The hill is actually much more rocky in 1863 than it is today. 160 years of repairs and rehabilitations and parking lots have really changed the nature of the hill. But when you go there today, oh, it looks like that's where the guns were. Very different in 1863. So physically getting the guns up there is a challenge. At one point in time, uh, Warren allegedly turns to Hazlitt and says, Hazlitt, this is no place for efficient artillery fire. And Hazlitt says something to the effect of, never mind that, the sound of my guns alone will be uh, discouraging to the enemy and heartening to our troops, or something to that effect. And Hazlitt figures out he can't even depress his barrels enough to actually hit any Confederates coming up the hill. But he mans his guns, and it costs him ultimately his life. The other reason we remember Hazlitt is that at one moment in the battle, uh, reinforcements arrive. This is the brigade of Stephen Weed. And while Weed's on the summit, uh, he's hit by a Confederate bullet, uh, topples to the ground, mortally wounded. And he calls over for Hazlitt. And Hazlitt, according to an article in the New York Tribune, which is the earliest account I've seen of this, bends over the body of Weed, and as he's bending over to hear what might be Weed's dying words, Hazlitt is shot and killed. His dead body falls on top of that of his friend. And Hazlitt is dead, and Weed is dead. Why Little Round Top? That big question. One of the reasons I think Little Round Top becomes enshrined very early on in our kind of national consciousness is the fact that it becomes this de facto site of Union martyrdom. There are not a tremendous number of casualties at Little Round Top, as we saw. 
but there are a very high number of high-ranking Union casualties. So we talked about Hazlitt. We talked about Weed. In a moment, we're going to talk about Patrick O'Rourke and Strong Vincent. There's no other spot, I would argue, on the Gettysburg battlefield that has such a concentration of these high-ranking Union casualties as Little Round Top. And so very early on, Little Round Top becomes almost like Canterbury Cathedral in medieval England. It's a place you go on pilgrimage to, to venerate these dead heroes. First monument on the battlefield, proper as we shall see, is on Little Round Top to one of these slain men. So Little Round Top is a place of martyrdom for the Union cause. Patrick O'Rourke. As I mentioned, uh, there are a number of martyrs, one of which is Patrick O'Rourke. Graduate of West Point, graduates in 1861, top of his class. Uh, widely regarded by the men in his command. He commands a little over 400 men on July 2nd, 1863. And as the fighting is unfolding, O'Rourke and his men, they're actually ordered to march down the Wheatfield Road. They're not intended to go to Little Round Top. But Governor Warren is trying to find reinforcements to bring to the hill. He rushes down to the hill himself and sees a, a regiment that he used to command. It was in his old brigade. And at the head is Patrick O'Rourke, this young Irishman. And he orders um, O'Rourke to bring his men up the back slope of the hill to help uh, the beleaguered defense of, of Little Round Top. And that's what O'Rourke does. He takes the orders on himself. Uh, they go up the hill in columns of four. They have to go around Hazlitt's guns and his caissons. They never load their weapons. They never load their muskets. So they arrive on the top of Little Round Top with empty rifles. But then the 140th New York, as the 16th Michigan is falling back, will charge down the slopes and drive back those Texans and Alabamians at the cost of, of Patrick O'Rourke, who's shot in the neck uh, and dies very soon after. One of the men that will really champion the memory of Patrick O'Rourke is his old adjutant, Porter Farley, who's at Little Round Top. He survives the battle, survives the war, goes on to become a very prominent doctor. But um, for Porter Farley, the hero of the Battle of Little Round Top is not Governor Warren, it's not Charles Hazlitt, it is Patrick O'Rourke and the men of the 140th. And Farley would later write about the death of O'Rourke. He would say, I never felt a grief so sharply, nor realized the significance of death so well. I choked with grief as I stood beside his lifeless form. For him to die was like me losing a brother. And more than that, he goes on to talk about the role of the 140th. He says, in a word, Gettysburg might have been the greatest disaster of the war and might have turned the scales in favor of the rebellion. We of the 140th are so self-congratulatory as to think that the arrival of the Monitor at Hampton Roads, just when she did, was a circumstance no more fortunate for the Union cause than was our timely arrival to fill the gap just when, and as we did on Little Round Top at Gettysburg, the service rendered there must be regarded as the supreme event in our existence. One of the things that's really interesting to note is how, for a lot of the men that fought at Little Round Top, that moment was again, the supreme moment of their existence, as, as Farley writes about. But they elevate the importance of Little Round Top to such lofty proportions that it's, it's almost inconceivable. So there are a lot of men that write about Little Round Top and say that if the Confederates had taken it, the Union Army would have been defeated at the Battle of Gettysburg. And maybe they're true. There are some accounts of the Battle of Little Round Top that say if Confederates get the hill, and if they can hold it, the very democracy, uh, the very experiment in American democracy crumbles to dust. You know, it becomes this post-apocalyptic society if the Confederates get little rounds on. Which, of course, is an exaggeration. But I think for the men that fought there, that's the, the level of significance they attribute to what they did on July 2nd, 1860. We saved the United States at Little Round Top. Historians debate that today. You know, how important was Little Round Top? What would the Confederates have done if they captured the hill? Um, you know, and that's an interesting debate to have. I'm not a military historian, so I don't want to wade too far into that. But as far as the veterans who fought there are concerned, supreme significance. Little Round Top was the key to the Union battle line. But not everybody agreed with Porter Farley that uh, O'Rourke was the real hero. There's another young man named Oliver Wilcox Norton. Oliver Wilcox Norton plays a very big role in crafting the memory of the Battle of Little Round Top. He is the um, bugler 
on Strong Vincent's staff. And as far as Oliver Wilcox Norton is concerned, uh, the real hero, it's not Warren, it's not Hazlitt, it's not O'Rourke, it's Strong Vincent. It's that 26-year-old lawyer from Erie, Pennsylvania, who takes the initiative to lead his brigade to the hill, who selects the position for the brigade, and who gives his life fighting on Little Round Top. That's the real hero. And uh, he has a quote here, Vincent should be credited with an instant appreciation of the situation and a determination and a determination to carry out the orders of the corps commanders without waiting for orders from the useless barns. <laughs> barns is the division commander. One of the things that is debated in the post-war period is how does Vincent's brigade get to Little Round Top? And there are two stories. One is the story of James Barnes, the division commander who says, I ordered Vincent to go to Little Round Top. The other story, which we hear from Oliver Wilcox Norton, is that it was Vincent who did it without orders, who took the initiative. It was Vincent who, having his brigade at the base of the hill, sees a staff officer racing around the battlefield and who intercepts that staff officer, who demands that that staff officer give Vincent his orders, and who takes the initiative to lead his men to the summit. So two different versions of how that happens. Uh, what is not debatable is that Vincent does lead his brigade to the hill. He selects a position on the uh, southern part of the hill, on the shelf that runs almost perpendicular to the main summit, and it's Vincent that selects the position. Vincent, um, he has this, this really great quote that's attributed to him. Uh, allegedly, as the, uh, the men of his brigade are, are marching to Gettysburg, they cross the Mason-Dixon line. They leave Maryland, they enter Pennsylvania. And for Vincent, who's a Pennsylvanian, this is a, an important moment. So he orders the colors of the brigade un uncased and unfurled, and he turns to a man next to him and says, what death more glorious can any man desire than to die on the soil of old Pennsylvania fighting for that flag? And I always thought, you know, that's it's gotta be apocryphal. It's, what pitiful stuff. Uh, and again, 19th century is a time of great sentimentality. And so I always struggled to Imagine Vincent saying that, but maybe it happened. Maybe it happened because he does write his wife earlier on in the campaign, and he says something very similar. He writes, "If I fall, remember you have given your husband a most you have given your husband to the most righteous cause that ever widowed a woman." And of course, he does die. He's mortally wounded, uh, allegedly. As the 16th Michigan is falling back, Vincent uh, rushes to his prominent boulder right behind their battle line. He doesn't have his sword that day. He just has his riding crop, allegedly a gift from his wife. And as he's waving the riding crop in the air, shouting out, don't give an inch, he's struck by a Confederate mini ball. Mortally wounded. Dies on July 7th, 1863. Uh, promoted to Brigadier General, though I believe he was never aware of that promotion. Today, if you go up to Little Round Top, you might be able to find this inscription. It's allegedly the boulder that he stood on. The first monuments to the battlefield on the battlefield proper are really to Vincent. So this, this inscription could date as early as 1864, one of the earliest monuments on the battlefield. There's another monument uh, just below the summit uh, that also proclaims to be the spot where Vincent was mortally wounded. That's in uh, 1878 that that is dedicated. Porter, uh, excuse me, uh, Oliver Wilcox Norton, that, um, that young bugler who was on Vincent's staff, he survived the battle, survived the war, and he will spend the rest of his life Champion, uh, being the champion for the legacy of Strong Vincent. He will befriend Vincent's brother, his widow. He will uh, be very instrumental in making sure that Vincent's legacy is enshrined on the Gettysburg battlefield. He will be involved in the creation of the monument in the 83rd Pennsylvania. He will speak at its dedication. And it's in part because of Oliver Wilcox Norton that you have that statue of Vincent on the 83rd Pennsylvania Monument today, even though it's allegedly not Vincent, it's just the beau ideal of a soldier. Because they weren't allowed to put an actual person on the monument. And so they just put a guy that looks exactly like this dude. <laughs> <laughs> he, will, um, he will convince the Vincent family to, uh, to donate Vincent's Gettysburg sword to the Smithsonian Institution. So they have it today. I don't think it's on display, but they are the caretakers of Vincent's Gettysburg sword. The, uh, the, the Vincent family wanted to have it on display at the Pennsylvania State House, 
And Norton says, nah, Billings a den of thieves. Give it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> he wins the day. He, um, he will write a book. Oh, we'll go back to that. He'll write a book. Uh, one of the early micro histories of the Battle of Gettysburg, the attack and defense of Little Round Top. And in terms of the historiography of the battle, uh, this is a seminal work. It's one of the first real in-depth histories of the fighting of Little Round Top. And of course, in the book, that's the first time the Warren letter to Porter Farley is, um, is published. In the book, who's the hero of Little Round Top? Strong Benson, that's who it is. Uh, and we still refer to that book today. But the story of Oliver Wilcox Norman, I think, also, also demonstrates the difficulty of trying to piece together the story of Little Round Top and the intersection between history and memory. One of my favorite letters associated with Vincent uh, that we have in our collection is a letter to uh, some veterans of the 83rd Pennsylvania written by Oliver Wilcox Norton. And I want to say the year is 1911 that he writes this. And these veterans, these survivors of the 83rd Pennsylvania, they want to put up a monument to where Strong Vincent was mortally wounded. And they write to Oliver Wilcox Norton, the bugler, who was with Vincent, allegedly, surely he would know, and we can place this monument on the battlefield. Well, Norton responds to these guys and says, listen, there's already the boulder. There's already that other marker. He's already on the 83rd Pennsylvania. And these are all different locations. I think any more monuments are just going to get confusing. He also says that he wasn't with Vincent when he was hit, so he couldn't help him anyways. And then by 1911, he was completely blind. So even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to help him out on the hill. So we don't know actually where Vincent was wounded. Uh, you can go up there and take your pick. My pick's the boulder. But um, over time, men like Oliver Wilcox Morton and Porter Farley, they started to get frustrated because they saw other individuals claiming credit for the Battle of Little Round Top and the Union victory. They saw other monuments being placed. They saw avenues being created named after other individuals, which they thought was an affront to history, and there was no bigger offender than Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. <laughs> Joshua Chamberlain. He is, um, at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, 34 years old, and there is no way to make Joshua Chamberlain unimpressive. He's a brilliant guy. We all know that. He speaks seven languages by the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, one of which is a, a variation of Aramaic which I think is about as dead a language as you can get. He, speaks in it. he um, of course, becomes Lieutenant Colonel of the 20th Maine, accedes to the colonelcy when Adelbert Ames leaves for the 11th Corps. He, um, he leads the 350 men of the 20th Maine in their first real stand-up fight on Little Round Top. He's, um, he performs well. I don't think there's any way around it. He performs well, and he, um, he survives. He survives, which a lot of his contemporaries did not. So after the American Civil War is over, and as I mentioned, for Joshua Chamberlain, that is the definitive moment of his life, Little Round Top. After the war is over, he's the guy that gets to write the history, because O'Rourke is dead, Vincent is dead, Hazlitt is dead, Warren will die early, and he never wrote about it anyways, and even lesser individuals, like James Rice, who takes over brigade command after Vincent is mortally wounded. He's killed in Spotsylvania. Norval Welch, who commands the 16th Michigan, on the far right, is uh, killed at Peebles Farm in uh, 1864. So Chamberlain's the only guy left standing. And so he tells his story. But Joshua Chamberlain is a perfect example of how complex history can be, because even Joshua Chamberlain can't figure out what happened. So let's take a look at one moment in the Battle of Little Round Top, just one. That's the charge of the 20th May. How did that happen? On July 6th, 1863, Joshua Chamberlain will write his first account of the Battle of Gettysburg. His first account. And here is what he says about the charge of the 20th Maine. And I've made the, the relevant section slightly larger. That's why I did that. So Chamberlain says, It was too evident that we could maintain the defensive no longer as a last desperate resort. I ordered a charge. The word fixed bayonet flew from man to man. I ordered a charge. Now, March of 1884, he hears other accounts that uh, confuse him. He's, he's trying to reconcile his version of history with what he wants it to be, 
and with everybody else, what everybody else is saying. And he's hearing accounts from men saying, you know, I, I don't recall hearing a thing about a charge. I saw the regiment going down the hill, so that's what I did. And so he changes his story a little bit. Uh, this is in, uh, in 1884, in March, he writes, at the crisis, I ordered the bayonet. The word was enough. So I didn't order a charge, I ordered the bayonet. October 3rd, 1889, at the dedication of the 20th Main Monument, writing about the order, he said, or speaking about the order, he says, in fact, to tell the truth, the order was never given, or but imperfectly. So I gave the order, but not quite correctly. 1913, he writes, through blood and fire at Gettysburg, which is published in Hertz Magazine, meant for popular consumption. And in uh, Through Blood and Fire of Gettysburg, regarding the bayonet charge, he says, one word was enough, bayonet. And it caught like fire and swept along the ranks. The men took it up with a shout. One could not say whether from the pit or the song of the morning star, it were vain to order forward. No mortal could have heard it in the mighty Hosanna that was winging the sky. And so now he's saying, you know, even if I said it, no one could hear it because it was so loud. And so with something as simple, as the charge of the 20th Main. Even Chamberlain is trying to figure out, okay, what the heck happened up there? And Chamberlain was never the guy that would argue with you. He tried to fit his story, reconcile his story with yours, uh, which is something he actually says to um, some men up on the, uh, the hill at the dedication of the 20th Main Monument. Uh, but there's, there's no denying the fact that Chamberlain, again, that time at Little Round Top, that was his pinnacle. In 1893, on August 1st, he receives a Congressional Medal of Honor for daring heroism and great tenacity in holding his position on the Little Round Top against repeated assaults and carrying the advanced position on the Great Round Top. He gets a Medal of Honor, and Chamberlain is incredibly proud of that. Um, the Medal of Honor in the late 19th century is a relatively new thing. It's created during the American Civil War. Prior to that, the United States military really didn't have medals the way that we think of them today. You know, Winfield Scott, I think in 1862, said, you know, giving medals a smack of European affectation. You know, a Frenchman might fight for ribbons and baubles, but an American fights for America. Uh, that changes over time. They introduced the Medal of Honor. And during the war years, during the war years, the best way to receive a Medal of Honor is to capture a battle flag, something tangible. Uh, so most of the original medals of honor awarded for the Battle of Gettysburg are awarded for capturing a Confederate color, capturing a battle flag. That changes over time, and it becomes kind of like the Wild West. In the 1880s and early 1890s, you had all these soldiers that liked the idea of getting a medal of honor, and so they're writing to the government saying, I did all these great things, give me a medal. And you have other men campaigning for one. Well, Joshua Chamberlain finds out that one of his good friends, Alexander Webb, got a medal of honor. And Chamberlain wanted one, too. He wanted one very badly. And so he basically writes to Webb and says, you know, tell me how you did it. How'd you get it? Um, and Chamberlain's well-connected. Remember, he becomes governor of Maine. He's, governor, he's politically savvy. He's one of the old you know, heroes from the state of Maine. And he ultimately will receive his Medal of Honor. And it, you, know, you notice the, the citation doesn't even talk about the charge. Just for tenacity and holding his position and carrying it up to the big round top. To get a medal, you had to have witnesses that could attest to your heroism. Let me show you Joshua Chamberlain's witnesses. These are the guys that said, yes, he did that, he's a hero. Fitz John Porter, Thomas Hubbard, and Alexander Webb. One, you're probably, you're probably wondering who in the world is Thomas Hubbard. He didn't fight at the Battle of Gettysburg, but he was from Maine. Fitz John Porter, what's he doing in 1863 on July 2nd? He ain't at Little Round Top. Alexander Webb's at Gettysburg, but he's down on Cemetery Ridge. So these are the three men that write testimony saying that Chamberlain should be awarded the medal uh, for, for what he did at Little Round Top. Do so I think Chamberlain earned the medal? Even by maybe today's standards, I think he did. I don't think that detracts from Chamberlain, but the simple fact of the matter was there weren't a whole lot of people still living in 1893 that could chime in on what he did, and Chamberlain would write that. He said, for my particular case, I am unfortunate in the fact that the people who could be witnesses of any special acts of mine in battle fell victim to their environment. They were mostly all killed. And that's a fair statement, but he gets the medal. And that further kind of enshrines Chamberlain in American mythology. I love this story. Chamberlain guarded 
the yeah. battlefield at Gettysburg, especially Little Round Top, especially Vincent Spur, he guarded that place very jealously. That was where people were going to come to remember what he and the men of the 20th Maine did. And um, he's well connected politically, like I said. He abhorred, he abhorred the fact that visitors would go to uh, you know, commune with the authenticity of the hill, would, would go and visit the 20th Maine Monument at Vincent Spur and see stone walls where his men fought. Because they didn't have time to build stone walls. They're there five, ten minutes before the Confederate attack. And so they had to use whatever natural protection the hill afforded. They didn't have time to stack up rock. Now, if you're a visitor, you go to Vincent Spur today, you see those two nice rows of stone wall following the sidewalk ending at the 20th Main. And most visitors think, oh, that's where they fought behind. They fought behind the walls. Chamberlain hated that. And his last act, he's literally writing in 1913, a year before he dies, his last act is to pester that guy on the right, John Page Nicholson, who's chairman of the Gettysburg Battlefield, the, monument, the commission, pestering him to take those stone walls down on Vincent Spur, get rid of them. Uh, and we have the correspondence in our, in our vertical files today, and they're fantastic, because Chamberlain is just such a nuisance over it. <laughs> now, John Page Nicholson, he had to deal with some stuff. Condemnation hearings, lawsuits, Dan Sickles, I mean, he had to deal with a lot. <laughs> and for him to say that it has been one of my great trials at Gettysburg not to yield to General Chamberlain's request to remove the wall, that's saying something. Because that guy, he, he's been around the block. And so ultimately, if you go to Little Round Top today, as you drive up the, uh, the summit, on the right-hand side is a small tablet. It says, this wall was built for defense, July 3rd, PM, 1863. That is John Page Nicholson's attempt to appease Joshua Chamberlain. I'll put up the marker that says the walls weren't there. As far as I know, that is the only marker on the Gettysburg battlefield whose sole purpose is to correct a misconception. And that's because of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. The next time you drive past, you can, you can thank him. Chamberlain, um, he had a tendency to rub people the wrong way. <laughs> In part because a lot, of, a lot of individuals who also fought at Little Round Top saw Chamberlain, his writing, his, his, um, his quest for the Medal of Honor, his speechifying, they saw it as an affront to other individuals who fought on the Hill, who died, and who weren't getting the credit uh, they felt that those individuals deserved. Strong Vincent, Patrick O'Rourke, etc., etc. <coughs> Ellis Spears is the second in command of the 20th Maine. He lives a long life. And he's very close to Chamberlain. They are cordial. They have a very cordial relationship uh, throughout, throughout both of their lives. But especially after Chamberlain dies, and Ellis Spear reads more and more about what Chamberlain wrote, uh, he gets increasingly frustrated with Chamberlain and how he's telling the story of the Battle of Little, uh, Little Round Top. Uh, he writes to Oliver Wilcox Norton about Chamberlain's official report and says, Chamberlain's report is a fabric of lies as far from the truth as well could be. And then he later goes on to say uh, in another letter to Strong Vincent's brother, I never had any but kindly feelings towards Chamberlain, but saw so much of his egotism that I could not write otherwise. And Spear would go on to tell a story about Chamberlain at a Bowdoin College commencement. And Spear is on, uh, on staff at, at, at Bowdoin as well, and Chamberlain by this point is president of the college. And they're having commencements, so all the students are you know, uh, in their seats, and it's kind of the kickoff to the, uh, the academic year. And Spear writes that he watches Chamberlain walk down the center of the aisle past students, and these students see Chamberlain, and they start to whisper to themselves and to each other, uh, there's the man that took Little Round Top. And Chamberlain hears this, and according to uh, Spear's account, Chamberlain stops, turns to these students that are whispering about him, and says, yes, I took it, and I held it. And he kept on walking. <laughs> and Spear said that when he heard that, he thought it was like robbing the dead. He should have said to those students, no, that title belongs to Strong Vincent. So that's you know, kind of how Chamberlain would rub people the wrong way. My favorite, my absolute favorite letter associated with the Battle of Little Round Top is written by Ellis Spear in, what was the year, 1910. <laughs> to his granddaughter, Mildred, who's all of nine years old at that time. And it's a very, it's, it's, it's a sweet letter because it's, it's a granddaughter 
who knows that their grandfather fought at the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's, I think, curious to want to know what your, you know, what life was like, what events you were a part of. And so that's a natural question. You know, granddad, what was the Battle of Gettysburg like? And that's what she asks Ella Spear. And by this point in his life, Spear is just so jaded with all of this. Uh, the, the back and forth, who's the hero of Little Round Top, who was there, that he writes, again, I think the best letter of any uh, Little Round Top veteran to his granddaughter, and he writes, Dear Mildred, I was very much surprised to learn from your letter that you were not at the Battle of Gettysburg. So many people were there that I do not fully understand how you missed it. It is not unreasonable, therefore, that you should wish to know something about it. I fear you will never know all about it. Nobody does, and nobody ever did, nor ever will. It was a very mixed up and extensive affair. I think that's the best caption of a little round top program that you can possibly have. No single factor will elevate the story of little round top to the pantheon of American high culture than uh, the popular culture. That drives visitation to historic sites, book sales. It's that, it's that. And of course, the story of little round top has been, um, has been featured in works of, of fiction and non-fiction uh, meant for public consumption. So really important is a book written by John J. Pullen in the 1950s. It's a regimental history of the 20th Maine. So after Chamberlain dies, there's this dormancy in terms of the story of Little Round Top. There's you know, years where you know, you're, if you're a visitor, you're gonna go to Little Round Top, you're gonna take in a sweeping view. You know, Warren might be your hero because there's this big statue, and that's kind of it. With the publication of that regimental history, though, it reintroduces Americans to this guy, Joshua Chamberlain. It's actually included in a Reader's Digest condensed version. So if you don't have time to read the whole thing, you can kind of go through the 20-page version of the story of the 20th May. That will inspire Michael Sharp, who writes The Killer Angels, a novelization of the Battle of Gettysburg, where one of the main characters is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, this college professor from Maine who performs heroics on Little Round Top and saves the day. And that, in turn, of course, inspires Ken Burns, the Civil War series. There's no more dominant character in his Gettysburg section than Joshua Chamberlain. It's basically, the entirety of the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg is the story of Joshua Chamberlain and the men in the 20th May. And, of course, Gettysburg. Filmed in 1992, I believe it hits theaters in 1993. That movie transforms Little Round Top in very fundamental ways. The, um, the site all of a sudden goes back to being this place of pilgrimage for Americans. Visitation to Gettysburg increases by 400,000 people the year after that movie comes out. 400,000 people. Now, the National Park Service had removed what was called Chamberlain Avenue, which is uh, the path that exists today that kind of takes you around the spur. Uh, it was overgrown. It was the backwaters of Little Round Top. <laughs> And as a result of that movie, the trail's brought back, and now all of a sudden it's the Joshua Chamberlain Superhighway that brings you <laughs> right down to the 20th Main Line. And then um, you have Jeff Daniels as Chamberlain. When most Americans, when they think of Joshua Chamberlain, they think of this guy, it's this dude. And one of the most difficult things for historians, or I assume battlefield guys to do, is divorce Jeff Daniels as Joshua Chamberlain from Joshua Chamberlain. It's very difficult to do um, because the Hollywood persona has just kind of overwhelmed the historical reality. On the other hand, though, I think one of the reasons why we're so drawn to Chamberlain is because of Daniel's portrayal based off of Shara's novel. Chamberlain is kind of an everyman, right? It's easy to put yourself in Chamberlain's boots and pretend you're this guy who, you know, on your resume, you got nothing on it that says, yeah, you're gonna be a leader of men in combat, and you're gonna perform heroics. But I think it allows people to, to, to imagine that they themselves, in moments of crisis, could do what Chamberlain could do. And you know, he's, Chamberlain's kind of nerdy, and a lot of us are kind of nerdy, and that's okay. Uh, we, can, we can still be great leaders on the battlefield. You know, I, I make this joke, I've had a lot of really brilliant college professors but a lot of very smart people teach me. I don't know how many I'd follow into battle. I don't know how many I'd let change the oil in my car. <laughs> Chamberlain proves that wrong, that no matter you know, what little box you fit in, you can do great things outside of that. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why Little Round Top is so famous, it's because of Joshua Chamberlain as portrayed in popular media. And of course, that corresponds to all the swag and judgments. I did not realize there was a Joshua Chamberlain onesie until I started this. I might get it. <laughs> action figures. He's got, he's got his own action figures. I, when I was nine years old, I saw this in Walmart, and I had to have it, and I still have it today. <laughs> I don't think they packaged this as a set, but Joshua Chamberlain Legos. And I love this more than anyone. Nothing says America like craft beer named after Joshua. That is pinnacle. You don't get any higher than that. He's amazing. And actually, I think Chamberlain, as a, as a figure, as a product of history and folklore, has outlived the movie. Because I ask visitors, especially younger visitors today, have you seen the movie Gettysburg? Most will say no. But he's infiltrated all these other aspects of our lives. He's featured in television shows. Uh, he's kind of this, this guy that, again, has made that bridge to, uh, to our modern consciousness. And then finally, Joshua's Tavern. If you ever go, O'Rourke has a, has a bar, as we all know, a restaurant here, so he's covered. Brunswick, Maine has Joshua's Tavern. So you can go have a Chamberlain beer and a Chamberlain Tavern and go look at the statue of Chamberlain and visit his house. Um, so why, why a little round top? Why are we so fascinated with it? What draws us to, uh, to that place? I think it's a combination of factors. It is a beautiful place. It is a, it is a dynamic place. It is, even if you, again, have no knowledge of the American Civil War, it's a, it's a spot that you can visit and be impressed by. It's a dramatic landscape. That's one reason. The fact that it's fought over in one of the pivotal battles of American history is another. The veterans who fought there crafted uh, a commemorative landscape on that hill that still impresses us today. So when we go and we see the Warren statue or the the castle monument to the 44th New York, that is impressive to us. They, um, the participants of the battle, they wrote about it. They enshrined it in, in memory. Uh, they fought over it. It's a great example of how history and memory are different things. But I think more than any of that, Little Round Top is a place where we go to connect with the past. It's a link to the generation that fought the American Civil War. And the veterans who fought there would, would write about that dynamic. One is Porter Farley. At the dedication of the 140th New York Monument, he, uh, he would say this, a visit to this field cannot be regarded as a mere holiday excursion. It recalls the most dreadful recollections, suggests the most serious thoughts. It nevertheless seems after this lapse of years to be invested with a haze which casts upon the picture as we reproduce it in our memory a semblance of unreality, which almost makes us doubt our waking senses and ask ourselves, can these things have really happened? And then there's Chamberlain, who at the end of his last account of the Battle of Gettysburg, the blood and fire, would write this. I sat there alone on the storied crest till the sun went down as it did before over the misty hills and the darkness crept up the slopes till from all earthly sight I was buried as with those before. But oh, what radiant companionship rose around, what steadfast ranks of power, what bearing of heroic souls. Oh, the glory that beamed through those nights and days, nobody will know it here. I am most sorry of all for that. And I think what he's saying, and what I think also Farley is saying, is that people want something real, right? When you, when you go to a place like Gettysburg and you go to Little Round Top, it's, it's a powerful thing. I think it's why we visit historic spaces and places. It connects us with the past. So when Chamberlain goes to Little Round Top as an old man, it connects him to those young men he fought with on July 2nd, 1863. It connects Porter Farley to his good friend, like a brother, uh, Patrick O'Rourke, and I think that's why you know, a million Americans visit the Hill today. Yeah, they're inspired by the movies, and they, maybe they had a Chamberlain beer, but they're looking to connect with something, to connect with the past and to make it real. That's my, that's my program for you today. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
before we let you go, the round top rehabilitation is still going on. And what we're trying to do with that is make sure that it'll last for another generation. So we're improving parking, we're improving the trail, we're stabilizing erosion, we're restacking a lot of those defensive works that were, uh, that were the result of the battle. We're adding new historic signage that'll hopefully give you a better experience when you visit the hill, whether you're a licensed battlefield guide or a regular visitor or you're on your field trip. Uh, the work is estimated to last 18 months, and of course, as you all know, every government project <laughs> and it's scheduled under budget. So, <laughs> to be the case here. If you are interested in the story of Little Round Top, February 5th, it's a Sunday, myself, as well as our park archaeologist, uh, will be here to talk about the rehabilitation, but more specifically, the archaeology that is being done as part of that. <clears throat> as historians, we're all working with the same stuff. We've got the same accounts, same photographs, same letters. I think the archaeology that's happening at Little Round Top, though, is going to uh, potentially lead us to draw some new conclusions about the fighting, what happened there. And archaeology, battlefield archaeology, fascinating stuff. What they found, uh, I think, could be blown away. So I encourage you to come back Sunday. February 5th. Yes. Have a good day. Have a safe day. Thank you again. Thank you.